Well, good morning and welcome to Ebenezer Evangelical Church here in Neath Abbey. Uh, my name is David Hales, I'm the pastor of the church here. Um, it's Sunday the 16th of August and we are gathered together today to worship our God. Let's pray as we begin. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we can meet together, that we can gather together, albeit virtually, albeit online, albeit from a distance. But we thank you, Lord, that we still have this sense that we are together, that we are your people, your church, gathered together under the sound of your word today. Father, we ask that you would bless this time to each one of us. May we know a real sense of your presence with us, Lord a real sense of your leading, and a real sense of your hand upon us. Be with us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now today we come to the end of our series in uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We come to the end of Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Um, so I'm going to read that section now. We're looking today at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 18. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labour we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And we pray that the Lord would add his blessing to the reading of his word. As has been our pattern over these, um, these, these times of lockdown with um, these virtual services, uh, what we'll do now is that we'll turn to the Lord in prayer before coming to look at that passage in detail. So let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we do thank you and we praise you. We thank you and we praise you because we can come into your presence. We thank you that because of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his saving work on the cross, we can presume, Lord, to come before you with our prayers. We can presume to come before the Almighty the Almighty God, the one who created and sustains all things. And, and yet, our Father, we can come before you this morning with our prayers, with, with our requests, with our petitions. And we can come and we can call you Father. Oh, our Father, we, we pray, we plead that your name would be glorified in our lives. We know that the... The Lord's Prayer begins with those words, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Lord, we pray that your name would be hallowed, that your name would be made holy, that we pray that your name would be hallowed and glorified in our lives. Lord, as we seek to live for you, we ask that you would help us to do that. But Father, we must come before you today and and seek your forgiveness and seek your cleansing for those things that we do that are not right. And so, Lord, we come and we say that we're sorry. We're sorry for the times when we don't live in accordance with your word. We don't live in accordance with your purposes. Lord, you know. You know the things that we do. You know the thoughts that we have. We come, Lord, and confess them to you now. In the quiet of our hearts, we bring before you those things that we know that we do. Help us to reflect on them, Lord, we pray. Our Father, as we lift these things before you, we ask that you would take them from us, that you would cleanse them from us. We, we thank you that we know that when we are forgiven by you, we are truly forgiven. Though our sins are like scarlet, you will make them as white as snow. Oh, Father, we thank you for the truth of that message. We thank you for the truth of the gospel, the truth that in our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven, we can be cleansed, we can be made new. And so, Father, we pray that you would be at work in our hearts, that you would be at work in our lives, and that you would be making us new day by day. Cleanse us, renew us, we pray, restore us, Lord. And help us to say no. Help us to say no to those things. When temptation comes, help us to say no. And help us instead to turn our eyes upon you. Oh Father, we thank you and we praise you that we know that forgiveness from you. Our Father, we continue to pray for our world in these strange days. In these strange times, we pray for our world. We see in so many places, we see the number of coronavirus cases increasing again. We see local lockdowns happening in various places. We, Lord, we, we, we plead with you for our world. Lord, we, we know that disease and sickness will come. We know that that is part of our fallen world, our fallen creation. And, and yet, Lord, now we, we plead with you that this virus might be stopped. It might be taken away. Oh Lord, as we look ahead to September with um, children going back to school, we know it's already started in, in Scotland with children going back to school, as we consider how things will be when the children in, in Wales and in England go back to school, Lord, we, we, we plead with you for our nation. But Lord, above all, we plead for the spiritual health of our nation. Lord, we know there is a disease much greater than coronavirus, the disease of sin. Many people still don't believe that there is a coronavirus. Many more people do not believe in the power of sin. And so, Lord, we, we plead with you for the spiritual health of our nation. We plead with you that as the gospel goes out week by week, we plead that people will hear it, that people will turn to you trust you and seek that new life, that healing that only comes from you. Father, we pray um, this coming week for the um, EMW camps again. We, we thank you for the way that the previous week went. We thank you for the way that this week at the ABBA conference has gone. And we pray for the camps work this week as children and young people hear the gospel. Lord, we pray that they would turn to you and trust you. Save them while they're young, Lord, we pray. Our gracious God, we pray for our world. We 
we pray for the the situation in Beirut, Lord, after that huge explosion. We pray, Lord, that you would bring restoration and recovery. We pray for those who are injured that they would be that you would bring healing. For those who are bereaved, Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort. We thank you for those Christian organisations that are, are working there to, to rebuild and to assist people. Lord, provide them with the needs that they need. Provide them with the safety that they need. Father, we pray for any who have been suffering in this last week because of the weather. We've seen lightning, we've seen storms, we've seen floods in various parts of the country. Father, we pray that you would draw close to those who are suffering. Help us, Lord, as a church, help us as individuals to draw alongside those who are suffering. Help us to bring encouragement and comfort and love, Lord, we pray. And Father, we pray too for ourselves as a church. We, we look ahead to our, and bring before you, Lord, our plans to be meeting together again in the church building. Lord, you know our plans to be aiming to meet together again during September. Father, we ask that you would guide us, grant us wisdom as we look to do that. Help us to make the right and wise decisions, we pray. And help us, Lord, as we meet together as that symbol of the body of Christ. Lord, may we be a good and strong witness to the community around us, we pray. Father, may we serve you as we should. So, Father, we come to you again now. We ask for your blessing on this time. We ask for your blessing on your word. Speak to us, we pray. Challenge us and teach us. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we turn back to... Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians and, and this last section of the letter uh, looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 6 to 18. So it'll be helpful to have your Bibles open in front of you uh, as we look through this section. Now if you were with us last week you may remember that we, we finished the previous section by looking at, at Paul's great certainty and Paul's great confidence. Paul's certainty in the Lord but also confidence in the Thessalonians that they would be living in a way that was pleasing to God and honouring to God. But what we have to remember here is that this didn't mean that Paul was in any way naive or that he was unaware of, of the issues that there are in church life. He wasn't just looking at the Thessalonians from afar and thinking, that's fine, they're all doing well, I don't need to worry about them. He was still worried about them. He knew, he was fully aware that there were issues and problems in the church that needed to be corrected. And so as we, as we look at this final section of the letter, we, we see Paul still continuing to teach, still striving to correct those problems in Thessalonica. And as we look through this section, uh, we'll do so using three headings to help us as we navigate our way. Those three headings are responsibility, relationships, and response. Responsibility, relationship, and response. So we look first at responsibility. There are two main themes in this letter. Uh, and indeed there were two main themes in, in Paul's first letter to the Th Thessalonians as well. Uh, the first, of course, was the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think pretty much every week when we've looked at these two letters, it's, it's been the return of the Lord Jesus. That if, if it hasn't been the focus, it has at least been mentioned. But the second main theme of these letters, and the one that Paul turns his attention to now, is that of responsibility. Now you might remember when we looked at uh, Paul's first letter, and to the Thessalonians, uh, he spoke 
uh, of those who were so confident that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ was imminent, that it was going to happen really quickly, that they gave up on everything else, including work. We had this picture of, of a group of people who were almost just sat looking to the skies, waiting for their Lord Jesus Christ to return. They weren't doing anything else. And as we come to this letter now, as we come to this section, it seems that that is still the case. That it's still an issue. As he's had to come back and address it again in this section. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, we saw that Paul taught the church to be workers to not give up on work, to simply wait for the Lord's return. And in chapter 5 of that letter, he, he instructed the church to admonish the idol. So, to, to instruct those who were being idle to get back to work. And both there, as well as here, in his second letter, Paul, Paul says that this is what he taught them when he was with them as well. And so it seems that now this is at least the third time, the third time that Paul is having to issue these instructions. Now I don't know about you, but, but sometimes we can become frustrated having to repeat ourselves, can't we? As parents, as teachers, in the workplace maybe. Sometimes we have to repeat the same things over and over and over again. And we can grow frustrated. But do you get a sense of that frustration with Paul? I don't think you do. He doesn't seem to grow frustrated, even though he's repeating himself, possibly for the third time. He does so graciously, and he does so reasonably. But, having said that, he does also use quite strong language. We see right at the beginning, verse 6, Paul says, Now we command you, brothers. We command. And he uses that same phrase a number of times. We command you, brothers. Paul is able to do this because he is an apostle. He is an apostle directly appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not in that position. And so within the church, I'm not in a position to command you to do anything. You're not in a position to command each other to do anything other than that which Scripture commands. Where Scripture commands, then there is our authority. But other than that, I, I, I have no authority to command you to do anything. But Paul does. Paul, the Apostle, Paul, directly spoken to by the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul was given that authority and so he commands the Thessalonian Christians. And in this section we have Paul speaking strongly against idleness, against laziness. The section primarily from verses 6 to 13 speaks about this and so that's where we're going to be focusing our attention to begin with this, um, today. Paul teaches some valuable principles which are as helpful and instructive to us now as they were to the Thessalonians those 2,000 years ago. Because you see in verse 7 Paul says, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. In other words he says, Remember how we conducted ourselves when we were with you. Remember how we lived. Remember those things that we did, how we conducted ourselves, how we carried out our lives. We didn't just live that way for show. We didn't just live that way to impress people. We lived in that way, says Paul, firstly because that is the way that all Christians, all believers should live, but secondly, to teach you how you should live. We remember this is a new church. Paul had, had planted this church in Thessalonica when he was there. When he was on his missionary journeys, he was travelling around. He went to Thessalonica and he planted the church. And so these people, they had, they had no instruction of how to live as Christians. And so Paul uh, and Silas, they, while they were there with them, they modelled for them 
what it was to live as a Christian. And then instructed them as well. Now it can be it can be galling, can't it, to have somebody telling you what you should do and how you should live, but then not keep to that themselves. I, I make no political point with this comment. But there have been cases, haven't there, over recent months with, with, with the lockdown, with the rules that have been in place. There have been those who have been in authority, those who have been telling us how to live, what we can and what we can't do. But they haven't exactly been following the rules themselves, which has led to understandable confusion and, and frustration. In this section, though, Paul is primarily speaking about work. He's talking about um, being at work to earn money. And he says, you saw, you saw how we lived when we were among you. Now imitate us. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, um, Three Men in a Boat, by the English author Jerome K. Jerome, uh, which was published first in 1889. And there's a section in this book, um, and this is a quote which has been paraphrased and, and used by many different people down the years, but um, Jerome K. Jerome uh, in the book says this, It always seems to me that I am doing more work than I should do. It's not that I object to the work, mind you. I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. I like work, it fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. As I say, it's been, it's been uh, used and quoted by many people down through the years, but, but Paul is nothing like that. Paul, Paul is nothing like that. You could just imagine the Thessalonians, couldn't you? If, um, if, if Paul was like that, you can imagine them saying, hang on a minute, Paul, hang on. You're telling us that we should all be working hard when you're just sitting there chatting and drinking tea all day. It wasn't like that. Paul, Paul was not like that. It wasn't the case in his situation. You see what he says there in verse 8? Or verse 7. Uh, you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Paul says to them, we could have come here. We could have come here and expected you to provide for us. But we didn't. We paid our own way. Paul was always... He was always keen to point out that, that when he preached the gospel, he did something for free. He didn't ever want there to be a cost to him preaching the gospel. Sure, there's a cost when people accept the gospel and their lives change because of it. But he didn't want it ever to be seen that people were paying him in order to preach the gospel. And so Paul and Silas, when they were in Thessalonica, were able to say, we paid our way. We paid for our board and lodging. We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Now, if we look back at Acts chapter 17 and, and read the narrative there, it seems quite likely that Paul and Silas were staying in the house of Jason. Um, in Acts chapter 17, it's mentioned that the mob attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them, that is Paul and Silas, out to the crowd. They stayed with Jason, we believe, but they paid their way. They paid board and lodging. They didn't take advantage of the generosity of the people in Thessalonica. And so Paul is able to point the church back to those times to say, you remember how we lived when we were with you? You go and do the same. You live in the same way that we did. And verse 8 continues. We did, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labour we were night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It wasn't just Jason and his household that Paul didn't want to burden, but everyone in the church in Thessalonica. Paul was by trade a tent maker, 
and it seems safe to assume, therefore, that he was able to carry on that trade while he was in Thessalonica. Indeed, it seems that wherever Paul went, he was hard at work. Preaching the gospel, but also making tents. And he worked, we read there in verse 8, he worked night and day. He wasn't a night, his, his, his wasn't a nine to five outlook. He worked hard. He worked hard and then he looked at the church in Thessalonica. He looked at those brothers and sisters in Christ and he said to them, there is no room for laziness. There is no room for laziness. There's no room in the church for sitting by idly while others are working hard. Indeed, in verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So Paul says to them, Jesus may be coming back imminently. We don't know. His return may be happening any day. But when he does come back, he won't expect to find you, brothers and sisters in Christ, Sitting there, sitting in your gardens, sitting on the roadside, looking expectantly to the sky, just waiting for him to come. That's not what the Lord Jesus is expecting. Especially not while your brothers and sisters in the church are working their fingers to the bone in order to supply you and to meet your needs. And you remember that the early church, they used to share a lot of things. They used to live together in, in, in much deeper way than we do and they used to share in order to meet the needs of those who were struggling. And so you've got a group here in the church who've given up work, who aren't earning any money. Paul says, if they're not going to work, let them not eat. There are lessons and principles here for us, aren't there? Even today, today there is still no room for laziness in the church. Among the people of the church, there is no room for laziness. As far and as long as we are able, we should be working. We should be working to earn enough for ourselves that we can eat. But also, we should be working in order to earn, to be able to give to the work of the church. And to give and share with those who are in need. In need. Not just who are idle, but those who are in need. Now we've... This last week, the UK has, has gone into recession. And it's been said that the UK is one of the economies in Europe in particular, that is suffering the most because of the recession, because of, because of the pandemic, because of the coronavirus. And, and one of the reasons given for that is that so much of our economy is based on the leisure industry. So much of our economy is based on people going out for meals, on going out for entertainment, on holidays. And, and those are all the sectors of the economy that are struggling. To Paul and the, and the Thessalonians, the idea of leisure time would have been a joke. They would have worked hard every day in order to provide for their families. There can be no room for laziness among the people of the church. But not just in the workplace, we should be willing to work in the church as well. There are many different tasks and many different ministries that the church are involved in. Now, the church will likely look quite different when we go back, when we can meet together again. What we're able to do and how we're able to do it will be quite different. We don't know when or if even we'll ever be able to get back to the way we were as a church. But even so, there will still be jobs, there will still be tasks to be done in the church. And again, I say to you, whatever your age, 
whatever your ability, there are still tasks for you in the church. As in a family, everybody has their role. As in a body, every part has its role. So in a church, we each have a task, a ministry to be involved in. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The way that we are, the way that we are as a church family, should speak to the world around us. The way that we are when we're together, and the way that we live as individuals, should speak to the world around us. So let us, like Paul, seek to live lives that are worthy of imitation. He says in verse 9, it was not because we do not have that right, but it was to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. We lived in this way, says Paul, to show you how to live before God. So let us too strive to live lives that, that others can imitate. Others in the church, others in our families, others in our communities in general. Let us seek to live a life before God, that others can seek to copy, seek to imitate. We can compare the Apostle Paul with the Pharisees and the scribes spoken of by the Lord Jesus, um, as recorded at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus says to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They preach, but do not practice. Jesus tells the people, listen to what they say. They're in that position of authority. They're in that position of responsibility. They are speaking the word of God. So listen to what they say. But do not do what they do. Their words and their actions did not match up. They were hypocrites, two-faced. They said one thing and they did another. They taught one thing but then didn't follow their own teaching. Paul was not like that. Paul was able to say, you know how you ought to imitate us. You know how we lived when we were among you. Paul's words and his actions matched up. Our words and our actions must match up. What we say we believe as a church must be evident in our lives. We all have a responsibility. A responsibility as far as we're able to pay our own way. To not be sponging off the state or sponging off other people but to use the gifts that God has given us to provide for ourselves and to provide for others where there is need. The, the Thessalonians had that responsibility, we too have that responsibility. But in this section Paul isn't just purely speaking about responsibility, he also speaks about relationships. And especially relationships within the church. We see this particularly uh, in verse 6 and then verses 14 and 15. Verse 6 says this. Now we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. And then verses 14 and 15 if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And so Paul here is writing primarily about how to deal with those who will not listen to his teaching. And there are two elements here of the relationship. And the response to those people. Because firstly, in verse 6, Paul says, stay away. 
Stay away from them. Do not identify with them. Do not condone what they're doing by keeping that same bond of friendship. Verse 6 says, keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. And then verse 14 says, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him. And so what we see, Paul is writing to the church. He is giving the church instructions. And we see some elements of that church. Paul saying, if they refuse to listen, if they refuse to obey, then have nothing to do with them. And so what we see here is, in essence, church discipline. Paul is setting out principles of how to deal with people who will not obey the word of God. And Paul isn't, he's not trying to cause divisions in the church. You know, he's not saying stay away and, and, and putting a rift there. What he is aiming to do is to bring unity. He's not trying to separate people. He wants to bring them together. He wants unity. Because he can see that if there are those who, who aren't pulling their weight, if there are those who <clears throat> think they can just go through life doing nothing for themselves, earning no money, providing no food for themselves or their family, but just seeking to sponge off the church. Remember, there was no state benefits or anything in those days. It was, it was all that the family would look after it itself and if the family couldn't then with the church it would be the church who would be looking to help and to provide and Paul can see that if there are those who could be working and are refusing to then that is going to promote strife and disunity seeing somebody who is perfectly capable of working but who refuses to and then expecting others to give them a meal that is what is going to cause issues in the church and so Paul says stay away have nothing to do with them but but he doesn't just tell them that and leave it at that because he even in that he wants them to show compassion for each other he wants them to show compassion. You see what he says in verse 15. Do not regard him as an enemy. Don't just shun him. Don't just send him away and have nothing more, nothing at all to do with him. But warn him. Warn him as a brother. Say, so if you carry on doing this, this is what is going to happen. He is your brother. He is your brother. Warn him. Don't just avoid him completely, but warn him. But there's a purpose to it all. There's a purpose, says Paul. The purpose is that he will be ashamed. The purpose of the, of the separation, the purpose of the warning is that that brother, that fellow Christian might be ashamed of his behaviour. And come back. We see that there in verse 14. Have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. And therefore amend his ways. It brings to mind a similar passage in Matthew chapter 18. Again, which sets a model, uh, an example of church discipline for us. In Matthew 18, it's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So just deal with it in quiet. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And he refuses, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So again, the Lord Jesus sets out those principles Warn your brother, warn your brother, and if he still refuses to listen, then have nothing to do with him. And so in this section, what we see is a lesson from Paul, a lesson about how we are to conduct our relationship, but also how we're to conduct church discipline. It's a letter in how to respond to those, sorry, a lesson in how to 
respond to those who refuse to listen to the word of God, to the teaching of God's church. But the aim of discipline, the aim of the discipline is always to correct the behaviour and to correct the relationship, to bring the brother or sister who is drifting from God, to bring them back to the Lord. That is always the aim of, of the discipline. And so we've seen the responsibilities, we've seen about relationships. But how do we summarise this section? Well, I think we need to summarise it by using the word response. Because this section demands a response. And we see the idea of response there in, in two different ways. The first response is a response to the Apostles' teaching. It's a lesson that we've heard before, but it's a lesson that that we come back to in this section, Paul reminds his readers of their need to listen to what they have been taught and to respond to it. To listen, to remember and to respond. Verse 6 says, um, in accord, so the brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Verse 10 says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. And verse 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter. So there is the teaching of the apostle. And as it goes on, Paul, um, we, we touched on this briefly a week or so ago, Paul signs the letter in his own hand uh, to confirm that it was his own letter. That you remember that we talked about the idea that it, there were maybe forged letters from the Apostle Paul. And he signs this one with his own signature to show that it was genuine, to show that it really was his instruction and that it had to be listened to. Paul's teaching was to be respected. Paul's teaching was to be listened to. Paul's teaching was to be obeyed. And so the challenge for us, as we've said before, is to obey and to respond to the teaching of God in his word. We have the Bible. That is for us God's teaching. It is in his word that we find his instructions for us as to how to live, as to how to make decisions, as to how to... How to, how to live before him. And so the challenge to us is to listen to God's word as it is preached. To listen to God's word as we read it. But not just to listen. Not just listen, but to respond as well. Every time we read or hear the word of God, we should be changed. There should be something about what we hear, something about what we read that should change us. It's one of the ways that God uses to sanctify us, to change us, to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus. Now we've heard today that Paul lived up to his own teaching. He lived out his own teaching. He wasn't like those Pharisees that we heard of earlier on who said one thing and did another. Their words were to be respected, but not their example. But with Paul, it's his words and his example that were to be observed, followed and imitated. So we see that we are to respond to the word of God. But Paul, in this section, also teaches us how we are to respond to each other. According to verses 11 to 13, we're all to seek to live quiet lives not involving ourselves unnecessarily in each other's business, but instead to, instead to seek in all things to do good. In verse 11, Paul teaches that all Christians are to be busy at work, not busy bodies. We're not to, to gossip, we're not to try and live other people's lives for them, but just to focus on our own affairs. Not to get so involved, not to meddle with other people, but to concentrate on ourselves. The gossip and the busybodying often go together with the idleness. 
when people don't have enough to do themselves, they turn their attention to other people's lives and other people's affairs. And to, to be honest, and I have to be honest here, in today's society, in today's world, that's a very easy thing to do. With the social media that we have, with, with Twitter, with Facebook, it's very easy to know what other people are doing and thinking. And it's incredibly easy for us to get caught up with that. To find ourselves following what somebody else is doing. To find ourselves reading what other people are thinking of that situation. And it's really easy for us to feel that we not just can, but that we have to comment on what other people are doing. And it's very easy to be very negative as we do that. Paul's call to us as the church is to be different. That's a lesson, uh, a message that we have heard a number of times through these letters. Paul tells the church to be different. And so the message for us today is be different. Be different in how we respond to each other. Be different in how you respond to other people outside the church as well. Be different in how you respond to politicians, in how you respond to governments, in how you respond to celebrities and to companies. Be different. And says Paul, do not grow weary in doing good. The church is to be a force for good in this world. It's sad, isn't it, that sometimes over recent years the church The, the, the widest possible definition of the church has been a force for evil. The church has harboured criminals instead of seeking that they receive the justice of the law. The church is to be a force for good in this world, a force for good in what we say, in what we do, in how we live. How can we seek to do good? How can we help others to love others and care for others? We can all reflect on that in our own lives and in our own situations, can't we? How can we be never growing weary of doing good? And as Paul says, and we've already thought, we are to respond in love. Even to those who are not responding well to the word of God, we are to respond in love. Even when Paul instructs separation, as we thought, he does so out of love, in order to bring that wayward Christian back, back to the Lord. We're not to separate from others out of anger, or out of spite, but only out of love, and only to point out to them the errors of their ways and to bring them back to the Lord. So in this, this short section of the letter we've seen that we are all to take responsibility for how we live. We are to be careful in our relationships both inside and outside of the church. But we need to be sure to respond, to respond to the word of God as we hear it and to respond well to each other. And so as we come to the end of our series in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and as we come to the end of Paul's letters, we've, we've spent these last three months or so going through these letters. What, what have been the main points and challenges for us? I suspect you will all take different things away from these letters. We've learned about what it is to be the church of God, how it is to, that we worship God. We've been reminded of the need to pray of the need to give thanks, and of the need to seek God's will and purpose in our lives and in our church. We've heard much about what it was for the church in Thessalonica to be under threat. Remember the church was planted, even in the face of persecution. They were afflicted, and Paul taught them how to live in the light of that persecution and opposition. 
we've been reminded today, we've been reminded of the need to not be lazy, not to simply be inclined to sit and wait and watch for the Lord Jesus to return. But above all, we have been reminded again and again in these letters about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is going to return. He will return. And we have been reminded and challenged over the need to be ready. To be ready for his return. The Lord Jesus will return in glory. And he will return to take his people to be with him. And to be with him forever, for all eternity. Our lives on this earth are just a blip compared to the eternal time that we will have with him. And so as we finish this series, let me, let me leave you with that challenge. Are you ready? Is your hope and your trust only in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that your sins were carried by the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to the cross? When he died on the cross, do you know that he took your sins? Because if you do, If you do, then you are ready for that day. It is only then, only then, if you are, are certain and confident that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you and took your sins upon himself, it's only then that you are ready for that day, whenever it might be, that the Lord Jesus returns. Until then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these letters. We thank you for these two letters written down 2,000 years ago from one man to, to a group, to, to a church to a group of people who he loved, who he cared for, and who he wanted to be ready. To be ready for the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Our oh, Father, how we thank you that we have these letters, and we pray that you would help us to take the message of these letters to heart. Help us to respond as we should, we pray. And now in the last couple of verses of this letter, I use Paul's words. Now may the Lord of peace himself give us peace at all times, in every way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, I trust that these letters have been a blessing to you. They've certainly been a blessing to me uh, as I've been working my way through them and then, and then sharing with you from them. Uh, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks now. Uh, so Dr. Phil, God willing, will uh, be taking our services for the next couple of weeks. Um, as ever, though, if you have any questions or comments at all, please do get in touch with us through our Facebook page. Um, and, and then we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, but thank you again for listening and God bless.